Hello, my name is uh, Laura Kröger, and I'm uh, here talking to you about Odysseus uh, LARP. A few words about myself. I am uh, a LARPer since 2000, and now if there is a, someone who doesn't have any idea what the LARP is, I will explain that a little bit later once we uh, get the mandatory instructions out of the way. Uh, I have been a LARP producer and LARP designer almost as long, and I am here as a lead producer and narrative designer of Odysseus, the LARP I'm going to be talking about. Uh, as my day job, I am a senior project manager in IT uh, and have been working in CGI for the past six or so years. Here is uh, the content about what I'm going to be talking to you. Uh, I will first cover pretty quickly what LARP is about, uh, and then I'm going to talk to you about Odysseus. Some numbers uh, about building a spaceship, uh, interactive experience, then designing the play uh, within the LARP, and then finally about creating the community that made this possible. This is me in our spaceship. Uh, I'm going to have uh, quite a lot of pictures between slides, uh, as well as uh, four short videos, since it is not possible to explain you what this uh, production was just with me talking. I think the four videos will tell more than anything I'm able to say here. Uh, there is going to be a, a little bit of medium medical core in, in those pictures, including blood and some wounds. Uh, those are all done by SFX, so none of it is real, but as a content warning that some of them will include those. Uh, the first video that I'm going to show is from the 2019 version of this production, uh, and everything else, all the picture and the rest of the videos, are from the 2024 version. Okay, what is LARP? Uh, I think that the uh, explanation which I often use is that it's an interactive theater without an audience. So, basically, uh, if you think of a role play, but you are playing instead of explaining what you are doing. So you are stepping into the uh, play area and you are acting as your character. Uh, so in a video game, instead of guiding your avatar do things in the game, you go and do those things yourself. And there are a lot of different LARPs. Uh, they can range from a couple of players to hundreds. Uh, they can last from a few hours to several days. Uh, there are heavily designed and pre-written uh, LARPs uh, to almost complete sandboxes where you get uh, create your own character and then just interact with other players in that LARP. Uh, there is a very huge price range as well. Uh, there are free LARPs and then there are LARPs that cost hundreds of euros to participate. Most of the LARPs are still volunteer-created, so we are not getting paid, uh, but there are also emerging some commercial events uh, in the field. Uh, this describes uh, pretty well the overall uh, theme or uh, atmosphere that Odysseus as a LARP uh, represents, so it was uh, rather dark, rather emotional story-wise, but we also had uh, a very immersive uh, set for this LARP to happen. Then a little bit about Odysseus. It was an international production. We had 104 players from over 20 different countries, and we ran this LARP three times. It was a five-day event, with 50 hours of continuous playtime during that uh, time. The ticket cost was 550 euros. Uh, for this LARP, we wrote thousands of pages of pre-written material, including the world descriptions, characters, instructions, uh, and a lot more. We would describe this as a Finnish-style LARP, but it's also very close to a more commonly known Nordic style LARP, uh, which is more heavily uh, leaning towards uh, designed experience where the players go through uh, 
some kind of a story uh, instead of just uh, sort of uh, feeling things in their characters. Uh, they might touch some very dark themes, and they usually uh, hope to players to take something with them from the LARP, from the experience. Uh, for Odysseus, we had uh, all the 104 characters were pre-written, uh, and the entire experience was very heavily designed. And let's watch the first video, which is a trailer. It is uh, the uh, video is shot from the 2019 version, and it is uh, promoting the 24 experience that happened last summer. Let's start or continue with some uh, numbers. Uh, this event was originally run in 2019. So uh, the design, uh, most of it, uh, the characters uh, were uh, written between the 2017 and 2019. Uh, and it was a huge production to do. Uh, and Originally, we were like, yeah, this was it. We are never going to do it again. Uh, three years later, uh, we announced uh, the 2024 remastered rerun uh, in May uh, 22. So for this 2024 version, we had over two years of pre-reduction. The entire production was done as a volunteer-created production. So none of us got paid anything. We had over 200 team members uh, for the 24 run, maybe 20%, 15 to 20% of them uh, were from abroad. Uh, places like uh, Canada, UK, Germany, Poland, Sweden, etc. There were a lot of countries where our volunteers came from. Some of them only participated in the pre-production phase and some of them actually traveled to Finland to be able to be part of the actual uh, event as well. Many of these team members are professionals on their own fields, uh, and they gave tens or hundreds, or in some cases, thousands of hours uh, to make this happen. Uh, the actual building phase where we created the spaceship uh, took about two and a half weeks. We had uh, rented a school in, in Helsinki for six weeks, so we built a little bit over two weeks, then we ran the event three times, and then we uh, disassembled everything. We had a budget of around 190,000 uh, uh, euros, and that was entirely covered by the entrance fees and costume rentals. In uh, 2019, we had less than half of that, so around 85,000, and also the ticket price was a lot cheaper in the first uh, iteration of this event. Let's start uh, describing this project uh, with building a spaceship. So we had an elementary uh, school, and our goal was to create a fully immersive spaceship, to have a look and feel uh, of a, uh, for our players that they were actually on board a spaceship. We wanted to also have functional spaces, so the in-game areas and the behind-the-scenes areas would be functional and support uh, the functions we had planned for them. And we wanted 
an effortless game flow and transparency, so that even if you weren't part of some aspect of the LARP, you could still know what was going on in, in other areas of the LARP. We had uh, 30 different spaces with varying priorities. Each space had its own room supervisor, and all of the rooms were built in cooperation with our uh, spatial, prop, sound, light, and software teams. Here is an overall picture of what one of the spaces looked. Uh, and here is a, a short uh, clip of our uh, spatial master document, which we're highlighting different spaces, uh, what was their priority in gameplay-wise, how prop-heavy they were, what was the budget for that room, and if that was in the second floor, first floor, or outside the venue. And I'm going to uh, show some of the spaces uh, from uh, plans to the uh, empty room, what we started, to the end result where we got. Let's start with our bridge. This was uh, the plan, what we wanted our bridge to look like. This is the classroom where we have started the uh, building by removing the chairs and the tables and putting some plastic on the windows so that we are going to get a, a complete darkness in the areas so we can only bring our own lights. And this is what it looked like in the game. We had also a hangar bay. This was uh, one of the biggest upgrades for the 2019 version. This was our original concept. We were going to have a small, uh, three small fighters and then one bigger uh, transport ship, uh, as well as the uh, general area uh, in the hangar bay. Uh, we created it in the gym hall of the school, and this is what it looked like. We had uh, also an engine room, which was a very uh, pivotal part of the LARP. Uh, it featured our uh, jump engine, uh, as well as, as a lot of the puzzles our players were doing during the LARP. The engine room spanned over two rooms, and then also there was a crawling space in the uh, room next to the engine room, which uh, was used as a negotiation room. And the engine room also uh, stretched to the hallway outside uh, of the classroom. This is one of the classrooms, and you can see through the windows uh, part of the hallway as well. This is the same room. Uh, with our uh, prop team uh, building the, uh, the special team building the engine room in, and this is a picture outside of the uh, same room, also featuring our hyperdrive engine. This is the main space uh, of the school, uh, and this is what it looked like uh, during the LARP. So in order to create uh, this area that felt like a spaceship, we used a light, we used sound, and we used a lot of prop building to create all of these different spaces uh, across the school. Uh, and you can see on the back of the picture, uh, we blocked one of the school's uh, hallways, and behind those uh, fake walls, we had our uh, off-game uh, areas, so the areas where we run the game and where we had our backstage, uh, where our, uh, all our software was and, and where all the decisions were done uh, outside of the actual ship space. This is a picture from the engine room hallway. But uh, Odysseus was not just uh, a, as realistic looking spaceship as we <laughs> could uh, create. Uh, we also had a lot of interactive elements in the game. Uh, we had in total almost 20 interactive IT systems. Uh, our uh, IT lead wrote a blog post uh, about them after the 2019 runs. And I am here only covering a couple of them, 
probably the most uh, visual ones. We had uh, or we used uh, open uh, source uh, bridge simulation software called Empty Epsilon. Uh, we used that in the bridge and for the pilots in the smaller fighter jet jets. And uh, we did a lot of customization into that in that software in order to uh, for it to serve our purposes. And during the game, uh, the players on the bridge uh, were playing the same game as the people in the hangar bay uh, inside their fighters. Uh, they were on the same screen and they were talking to each other through headsets. So the bridge needed to do scanning of the enemies and tell the fighters which uh, enemies they needed to shoot and with what, what frequency. Uh, they were also releasing and docking the fighters uh, in. So players in to two total different areas of the school uh, were playing together uh, in this simulated space uh, where both the main ship and the smaller ships were in. Uh, our engineers, uh, in the MT Epsilon there is an engineering system uh, where you uh, put this little tiny uh, people do fixing in the ship. We had disabled that in the empty epsilon and in our game uh, the tiny helpers were actual players who were running around the ship doing puzzles uh, and tasks in order to fix the ship that got damaged throughout uh, the game. There were different kinds of games and they uh, were transferred uh, into the engineering system, uh, which gave tasks and the players then took those tasks and used, uh, in most cases, our mobile application to go into the area where the task was assigned and then do that task. There were a lot of uh, different kinds of tasks, for example, uh, fuse boxes where you needed to uh, change the broken fuse. There were manual tasks uh, where you needed to uh, scan a QR code, then do uh, the puzzle as instructed, and then complete it. And once these tasks were completed, it automatically went into the engineering system and uh, put the task into the calibration queue. And the calibration queue was created in order to not allow our players to uh, speed run through everything. So even if the players were really, really efficient, then there was still a timer which every task needed to take uh, to be completed in, for us to be able to uh, balance the speed which we wanted things to be uh, fixed. Uh, we had an AOC a data hub called uh, Interface where uh, players could uh, check medical data, check uh, military files, uh, send messages to each other, as well as NPCs, which are non-player characters. In our case, guess, case, us as an organizers, we are answering as the relatives and friends and colleagues of the players uh, on board other ships to create the feel of a really living uh, world, also uh, outside of the actual ship. We had info screens around the ship, which were constantly telling players information. So uh, they knew what shift was on, what time was it. There were news uh, being played on the info screens. So everybody on the ship was constantly uh, aware what was going on. And when there was a hybrid drive jump happening, uh, there were, were uh, big counters in all of the info screens giving the same information to all players. And I'm going to show you uh, a bit of the jump a bit later on. Uh, we had a functional airlock with sounds uh, where uh, you needed to open it and then there was a countdown for it to depressurize and before you could uh, open it again. Uh, we had uh, the entire LARP did not happen inside the ship. We also had a land missions where we took our players in the uh, Finnish woodlands to complete tasks. And all these land missions were streamed uh, on the big screen uh, in the middle of the ship uh, for players, uh, for also those players who couldn't participate to know what was going on in the land missions. Uh, we had both live and text NPCs, so these were not an actual players, but one, uh, our organizers and helpers who were either writing messages to the players or in some cases also appearing in, as an enemies uh, in the land missions or boarding the ship or sometimes uh, also as a friendly uh, visitors from other ships. 
Uh, we had science puzzles, uh, which were very carefully designed uh, as a part of the game's core loop, which I will uh, explain a bit later. And then we had an SFX team on call throughout the entire LARP to create the very realistic looking wounds our players would uh, receive uh, in the course of the game. Here is our SFX team in action, uh, making sure that the marine team that's just returning from a, a land mission is looking suitably bruised before entering the ship. This is our uh, video of our red alert and how it looked in the bridge, and you can partly also see how it looks like outside of the bridge as well. So there were about 30 of those light pillars scattered across the ship. Uh, and also there were uh, speakers all around the ship. So when there was a big event, uh, it was clear everyone on the ship what was happening. So this was uh, taken from the bridge, but wherever you were on the ship, if there was a red alert, you knew it. Here is a picture from our science lab uh, where you can see part of the science puzzles our scientists uh, worked tirelessly to solve throughout the event. And here is uh, a bit uh, of our hyperdrive jump. Hyperspace jump drive ready for a safe jump regulated by EOC military safety standards. Let's see when the actual jump countdown starts. video does no justice to the sounds, uh, but when you have dozens of speakers around the ship, uh, the jump could be heard and felt everywhere. Uh, the uh, hyperdrive jump lasted from five minutes to up to 15 minutes, and that was also our uh, window of uh, doing prepares. So if we needed to fix something during the jump, all of the systems were offline, so everything on the bridge was dark. And if we needed to do some fixes, we were able to do that. And we also changed the empty epsilon scenario during the jump. So this was done uh, remotely from our uh, behind the scenes. Uh, I will speed a little bit up. Um, a little bit about designing the play. We had uh, 10 to 20 pages long pre-written characters in every player, which included a background, connections, goals, and plans. Uh, we had a schedule planned in 15 minutes uh, accuracy for the entire 50 uh, hour duration. Uh, the game ran around the clock in shifts, both uh, for the players and us in behind the scenes. So in every... Uh, Around the clock, there was something happening. There were dozens of pre-planned events happening during the LARP, uh, and everything was designed to guide the players through uh, this uh, sort of a tunnel, but we did a lot of work uh, to make 
it, to hide it uh, behind uh, a plausible player decisions. So even though the players weren't able to go wherever they wanted, uh, we made it sure, or as well as possible sure, that they wanted to go where we wanted them to go. <laughs> uh, and every aspect, the characters, the events, uh, everything that was happening was designed to support the overall narrative of the LARP, which I unfortunately don't have time to go in more detail. <laughs> um, this is a picture from our med bay. And this is uh, the core loop uh, of our game. Uh, we the uh, LARP was originally inspired by Battlestar Galactica uh, episode called 33, where they are escaping of uh, Cylons, uh, and they need to jump every 33 minutes. Uh, we made the jump uh, count a little bit uh, longer. Uh, the players uh, had this jump cooldown that was reset every 2 hours and 47 minutes, allowing them to do a safe jump, which meant that they are not breaking their ship, ship if they do a jump. Uh, and there was enemy coming after them uh, around every two, uh, two and a half hours, so they needed to fight off the enemy for a, a little bit before they could do a safe jump and then go into safe location again. Uh, the jump itself uh, required officers to order the jump to happen, bridge, bridge crew to do the initial jump preparations, then engineers to do puzzles to uh, prepare the jump, and once the jump had happened, uh, in every other jump, the players sent marines into the land missions to recover uh, these things we called beacons, uh, which were breadcrumbs left by their ancestors that allowed them to try to find uh, the home uh, where they could possibly uh, go into the safety. And once the marines had found this beacon, it's then the scientists had this next jump time to solve the puzzles, so we needed to design the land missions to be completed around an hour so that they could uh, drive into the location, complete the land mission and drive back within the 2 hour and 47 minute uh, timer. And we needed to design all of the science puzzles so that the solve time would be as close to 2 hours as possible uh, to give the coordinates to the next uh, land mission. And we managed to do this uh, pretty uh, consistently, but we were also monitoring very closely, uh, especially the scientists, and giving them hints uh, where to go if they seem to be stuck. This is a picture from another run of the same uh, scene as the previous picture I had. Uh, and this is a picture of our... Uh, event wall, uh, so the schedule of the LARP. Uh, there was in, to uh, in total of 18 jumps, and they were the things that uh, made the intervals for the LARP. So we knew what would happen in each jump. Uh, so if there was a land mission or if it was a science uh, scientist's time, uh, where there were events in the fleet, uh, when there were going to be attacks, uh, when there were going to be other events, when we needed to send some messages from their relatives on the ship, and all that uh, was written in the board beforehand. Here is a picture of the main hall, and this is the speech from the Admiral, uh, and this is where we also streamed all of the land missions. And then this is the video from uh, the 24 run. Also, all the musics in the videos are composed by our, by our team, which have created an entire soundtrack for the LARP. <laughs>
then a few quick words before the questions about creating a community. Uh, we had uh, over 200 volunteers in 24, and we had uh, a bit less, around 180 volunteers in 2019 creating this LARP. Uh, so uh, it's been often asked, how, how do we do this? How do we get so many people to give their free time uh, to create something like this? And I gathered here some of my thoughts, uh, why people would want to participate uh, in this uh, project uh, and also to come back since a uh, majority of our volunteers in 24 were the same people that were part of it also in 2019, but we also get a lot of new people. And I think the second bullet there, the ownership, is one of the big things. Uh, I'm here talking to you, but we had a 200 people doing this, this LARP, and I think that a lot of those people felt ownership uh, regarding this production, regarding of how much or how little they were part of it. Uh, we had a supporting and welcoming atmosphere. We made our very best uh, to make everyone feel welcomed, uh, feel that they knew how they could help, what they could do, uh, and also be able to do as little or as much as they wanted. Uh, this was also a challenge. A uh, LARP like this in 2019 had uh, never been done in Finland, and I dare to say it's never been done in, in worldwide. This is uh, like specifically unique production. Uh, the sheer scale of it is something uh, extraordinary. So uh, the opportunity to be some part of something like this was a huge factor for people why they wanted to do it. Uh, the chance to do something on this scale. Uh, and I think that in, in when we this uh, year started to do the building phase, uh, also the memories and stories from 2019, there were a lot of people who were like, I'm not going to miss this a second time if they weren't part of it in 2019. Uh, and I think that the one which I also built a lot in, especially in the 2019, but also in 24, uh, was uh, the trust our team had uh, for the other people who were doing it with them, uh, that we could pull this off uh, and uh, the reputation that we already had uh, before that and especially after the 2019 runs. Here are a few links if you want to know more uh, about the uh, production. But let's jump for the questions. Amazing. <laughs> I mean, like, I have more questions for the <laughs> Q&A than, than we can actually ask for. But the same thing as the others, that if you have a question in the audience, just uh, raise your hand and I'll get the mic to you. I, I see a lot of faces like there's more, <laughs> more questions to think about. There, there's one from the chat that I want to start with. Next plane, five years or <laughs> again, never again. <laughs> is that how, how does it feel like now? Uh, currently it is uh, never again, but we do have uh, a lot of our stuff stored, which we did not have in 2019. So uh, we hopefully can do something with those. Uh, if it is this one or something else, I don't, I, I don't dare to say <laughs> yet. Uh, but uh, it is a huge thing to do. So it is not something uh, I, I'm willing to commit <laughs> doing, <laughs> possibly never again. But uh, it was still the probably the most awesome experience of my life. So <laughs> yeah. So you don't hastily go to the conclusion <laughs> of making it again. But run us through like what made you do it. Uh, like 2009 thing was like the last like a normal year I guess but was it the pandemic that made you crazy to think that you can do it again like what, what was the, the kind of uh, process behind the restarting? Uh, I, I think that the pandi pandemic definitely played a part but in in a way that uh, if there hadn't been one we probably would have uh, at least some of us would have probably started doing it again sooner and it would have been a bad idea. So it was actually really good that we had to have uh, a couple of years of uh, time to think about it. Uh, and uh, 
one of our, we had only three main organizers in 2019, and once the third of them, the, our IT lead, said that uh, she would do it again, then that was uh, sort of the final thing we needed to uh, start actually planning of. So it was a little bit happen. of a longer process to get everybody back on board <laughs> after yeah. the first installment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it nice. was. So um, you were a little bit touching this, but uh, can you reiterate uh, what were the main differences between 2019 and this year? I mean, like there's like bigger, better, or were there just uh, yeah, I think also <laughs> iteration of the gameplay and those uh, kind of things? Yeah, I think that the biggest uh, changes were from our uh, coordination side. In 2019, we, in all honesty, had no idea what we were doing. Uh, we started building something. We, I have our early scratches where, or early sketches where we are like, yeah, it would be a cool if we had something like that. I was the lead producer and when I walked into that school in 2019 to build the, uh, uh, start the building, building phase, I had no idea what we actually were going to create uh, and how time consuming it would be. In 24, we knew exactly what we were going to do. So uh, we were also a bit more prepared uh, on that. Uh, the story was, uh, Basically the same, we did uh, a lot of small enhancements, we uh, reiterated some of the characters. Uh, a lot of the builders went like, okay, this is what we did 2019, we are going to do it better this time. So there was, it was uh, an upgrade in, in many sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, I wish I would have been able to at least come and, and check the site. Um, were there any like same players between the 2019 and 2024 plays? Yeah, there were. Uh, they, did they play the same roles or did they just switch to uh, roles? There were one player who wanted to ex uh, specifically play the same character, um, but mainly in different characters. I think that we had uh, we had 350 signups uh, in 2019, and a bit over 300 of them got a spot. We had almost 1,000 signups in 24, so only a third of them got a spot, and it was uh, a blind lottery. So uh, it was pure luck if you get the spot or not. And I would say that almost 50% of the players from 2019 reapplied, and maybe 50-ish or. 30 to 50, I'm not, I don't know the exact numbers, got to play it again. That's amazing. Any questions? There is one question. I'm so perplexed. This is so <laughs> crazy. But there, there is Nora asking a question. They, we're lucky to have the space team to start and the space <laughs> team to end. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it really is breathtaking what you guys have done. And uh, I, I, I was just thinking while I was watching, like talk about human centered was like the only thing that came to my mind that my God. Um, but um, I actually wanted to ask, so, I mean, with my background, um, I'm really interested to understand also like, while you have been working on this and I understand it is based on, um, as you said, you had inspiration from, uh, um, uh, Battlestar Galactica. Battlestar Gar Galactica, yeah. But did you um, have a sort of like an academic take or maybe like a research take on the, or maybe some kind of um, help in understanding, for example, the possible scenarios, um, for example, from space agency or other body that works on this field? Uh, we had some space enthusiasts <laughs> in our, our uh, crew, so people who did uh, want to make some things feel realistic, but early on we sort of went uh, with the stories, uh, sort of that was our main guiding uh, sentiment. So the facts were not that important in, in this iteration, uh, but there were some people who spent way too much time uh, thinking of what kind of planets would actually actually work out as a land mission <laughs> things and, and stuff like that. May I just ask a little bit more that if there was a future for this project, would you see something like that as uh, something that can enhance or is it the way you build it now is working as it is? I think that if we if, if this project would to continue, it would be pretty much the iteration we have now. Uh, but uh, I think that it would be interesting to also do something new. And uh, because uh, our main inspiration uh, to do it again was that would I regret more not doing it or doing it again and uh, ended up uh, that I would regret more if I didn't. But now I'm sort of like leaning towards that it's now done twice. So it would be interesting to do something uh, new as well. So maybe something with Essa. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> we can talk more and see. This is it's a really interesting project. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, completely unrelated. Completely unrelated. But I just feel this urge to ask this. Like, how did you? How did you choose the school or how did you get the permission to use the school? Like, how does that work? Did you, you did it on the same location? Yeah, we did it in the same location. And uh, in before the 2019, we were actually searching for uh, possible locations. And the schools that they are having a summer break uh, is a pretty uh, good decision. We were going to check few other, uh, we went to check few other schools as we had a connection in Helsinki, Helsinki City uh, to uh, their, uh, services which are renting out the schools uh, but when we entered to this school where we were like yes this is our spaceship as it had a really good look uh, and feel uh, to begin with uh, to incorporate everything we wanted to build so uh, when we started to do it again when we decided to do it again that was the first thing we asked uh, and it was a little bit longer process since things have changed a bit in past five years how the schools are rented out during summertime uh, but uh, at the end they were like yeah we want you to uh, come here and we'll make it happen <laughs> have you talked to the school kids i mean like if i would be in that school as a school kid i would be like wow why can't we have the classes <laughs> in these props but have you talked to any of the kids that how they feel about their school being turned into a spaceship yeah a little bit we had um open door uh, event in, in both of the uh, iterations in 2019 and 24. And in both uh, cases, a lot of uh, students in that school came to those uh, tours to see what, the, what we had done uh, with, their, with their school. And then they were pretty amazed. So uh, that was also something we wanted to do. Uh, and in 24, we had almost 900 people uh, going to tour around the ship in the open doors uh, day. Yeah, well, that makes sense. A lot of people probably would have been asking to come anyways. Yeah. You have to plan for that. Yeah. Any more questions in the audience? There we go. One more question. I have two more that I really <laughs> want to ask. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, super interesting stuff. If someone was like interested in um, maybe like getting into helping out uh, with pre-production, like writing or stuff like that in, in events such as this, uh, how would what would be like the best avenue yeah. to get into those communities, I guess? Yeah, great question. Uh, I think that LARP is uh, currently in a little bit of uh, a shifting, so we uh, still use Facebook as a, a lot, a lot of uh, as a form of communication. Uh, there is a Facebook group uh, called Suomi LARP, uh, which is where a lot of LARPs are still advertising. We are moving also to Instagram, and then we have a LARP calendar. But those are both uh, venues which mostly. Uh, advertise uh, LARPs as a participants. So I think that uh, mainly uh, if people want to participate in making LARPs, uh, then we also have a couple of Discord servers, but they are also a little bit difficult for like a, a larger audience. Uh, so currently I think that the Facebook is still, the Suomi LARP group is probably the best place to just uh, hang around. We, for example, did uh, post uh, our application for uh, uh, creators in there, uh, but uh, it is a little bit of a uh, ongoing process for us to make LARP more accessible and more known uh, also outside of our own communities. A pro product or uh, process, uh, what is it, like a, a thing like this will probably help you to advertise and make people really excited. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> I mean, I have so many questions. Um, if you don't know what LARPs are, you can read a lot about that. I would have asked uh, a, a bit of a definitional question, but I will ask this other one because we're running out of time. Is that there, I knew that there is like a lot of professionals, like your IT professional there, but there's also game professionals, game industry professionals, uh, part of the productions. So at least like House Mark play some next games. Uh, is that can you can you tell a little bit of <laughs> about that and more? Uh, I think that uh, a lot of LARPers sort of uh, want to gravitate towards the game in industry, uh, especially LARP cr uh, creators uh, also think that the game in industry is, is really interesting. Uh, venue for work. So uh, I'm not a bit surprised that there is a lot of uh, sort of like a, a cross between game developers and LARPers and LARP designers. Uh, 
and yeah, we had uh, uh, several of our volunteers, well, also from the from the game industry. Uh, giving their expertise to make this game to happen as well. When we talk about it, it's like a volunteer project, but they're like a, a professional journalists and uh, I don't know, like a theater people that are also yeah. helping hands there. Yeah, so our sound team, light team, uh, marketing team, uh, our uh, project management, uh, our IT, we had a lot of uh, like coders uh, creating the softwares. And I think that one of our lead architects uh, uh, estimated that the software we created for the 2019 would be around a half a million if it would have been created as a paid job. So, yeah. <laughs> so Disney <laughs> yeah. maybe could do this or not. Okay, so what's your favorite free feature from others say that you're going to want to take to the next LARPs that you're going to create? Is there anything that you kind of learned uh, that this is what I want to do also <laughs> next time? Not necessarily the thing. I definitely, I think that I also want to do a new things, but I think that the feature which I really, really enjoyed was our uh, jump, how it integrated so much of uh, our physical spaces, our software, our gameplay loop, like all of the different elements uh, came together in the jump, and it's it's still uh, uh, I get uh, goosebumps when I I hear the jump sound. So it it is uh, like as a one single element. I think that that uh, combines a lot of what what was great in this production. Thank you, thank you, Laura, for your talk. This is incredibly inspiring one, and thank and thanks you. for joining us.